welcome all colleagues and all doctors on our today seminar on the regenerative periodontal surgery. We share a long experience using Strauman Endogain in inner matrix proteins and as you already see here on two examples, these are examples we are dealing with bony pockets or um, recession type defects. So usually when we have to treat a difficult periodontal patient, we have to decide if we go for conservative, for regenerative, or maybe for implant therapy. However, we always have to think of a long-term, good long-term prognosis. So how can we improve the prognosis for the tooth or the implant? And more um, very often the question is, when is the optimal time to start with surgery? For instance, as you see on the lower slide, a localized bony pocket on a central incisor, which of course is not an optimal situation for the patient. Coming back to the main goals of periodontal therapy, this is of course still reduction of bleeding on probing, that means absence of bleeding, and of course reduction of pocket depth. So the picture we see here is obviously not very aesthetic case, but however from periodontal point of view is successful treated case. However, if you see the goals that are pointed out on the right side of the slide, you see here gain of clinical attachment. Of course, we want to regain clinical attachment. We secondly want to facilitate the long-term maintenance therapy. And today, we go, of course, in many cases for an aesthetic outcome. As you see here on the lower slide, of course, you see a big bony defect which has been filled up with granulation tissue that has been removed here and now I can start for a regenerative approach. The third point is to think of a better situation for restorative treatment. That means if we do crown or bridges, bridge work, we need a stable periodontium and this means sometimes also pocket reduction procedures. But the main goal, of course, today is the regenerative procedures. I would like to start with a case that has been in my hands for now more than 18 years. And that was a patient around 55 years of age with deep periodontal pockets you see here in the, in the front area between the incisors, you see uh, the deep pocket, you see also migration of teeth. And we treated the patient, that was the beginning in 1995, we treated the patient with a disease, uh, with, a, with a common approach like periodontal treatment together with orthodontic treatment. You see very clearly uh, after the fa first phase of periodontal treatment, the migration of the teeth that has occurred and already a little bit of recession of the tissues. Then we started with a orthodontic treatment and this is the x-ray at time when we started the treatment. You will see the bone defects in the especially here in the upper front but also in the premolars, molars and also you see it here. Also it can be seen very clearly here on the lower teeth. But then after that was the beginning we had around pocket depths of four, five, six, seven millimeters with um, also mobile teeth. Especially here in the upper front that was a, a big problem for the patient. Then after doing conservative and surgical periodontal treatment, we achieved a stable situation together with the orthodontic alignment of the teeth, a, a satisfying aesthetic outcome for the patient. Then we want just to stabilize the situation and this is the same patient 
in 2013. That means 18 years after we started the treatment, the, the gums are still in place. We regained some bone. We have a stable situation. It's still the old splint that was done here. That was already that was in the beginning only provisional as a provisional splint, but it has now stayed for years. We lost one, only one tooth here, the second premolar in the upper jaw, just for endodontic reasons. So we know that we can achieve a very good stable result for the patient that was a result in between at 2011. And these are the measurements you see now. They are not any more deep pockets deeper than five millimeters, no six, no seven millimeter deep pockets. So we know that this may give us a stable long-term result. How can we achieve this? Of course, we can achieve this with a periodontal surgical treatment, but the regenerative approach is a very important point in dealing with these complex cases. What we have as a scientific outline for the therapy, of course, is due to the fact that we know, for instance, by this study from the group of the periodontal clinic in Bern, Switzerland, that if we end up after the first phase of the active periodontal therapy, if we end up with a pocket probing depth of more than six millimeters, it means that there was much more recidive and much more tooth, less, tooth loss as compared to a three millimeter pocket at the end of the active treatment. And this is a long-term study. You see here it's a it's a mean observation time of a life of about more than 11 years. This means for our concept that each pocket depth of greater or greater equal six millimeters means incomplete periodontal treatment and in fact needs further therapy. And that means very often surgical therapy. So we go in many cases for the regenerative approach. That means we need a periodontal tissue regeneration. That means healing of hard and soft tissue by local cells like fibroblasts, osteoblasts, cementoblasts, gingival fibroblasts and epithelial cells. We need, of course, as you see here on the left slide, it was also a case that was treated by regenerative periodontal surgery, we need, of course, some bone that may migrate here into the defects. So we need some support from the surrounding tissues. If we have such support, we see, as you see on the histological slide, we can achieve by means of enamel matrix proteins a very proper um, regeneration. That means we see here in this example a new cementum, a new periodontal ligament, a new bone. That was from an animal study that was carried out in our clinic and the red arrow was the original base of the defect. And you see the above the red arrow the regeneration in this example. Of course, in the clinical situation, we use this principle. You see a first clinical example. Here there's a, a lower molar with a deep vertical defect up to the apex. Then we did periodontal therapy, first scaling root planning, then surgical treatment using amnogain material, enamel matrix proteins were applied to the root surface in 2002. And in 2011, it's a long-term observation. You see a very nice, a very clear regeneration, building of new tissue. And that was a case that was only treated by, surgery, by surgical means using um, endogain. Of course, there are other techniques for regeneration, and you have to deal with it for just for a second. You, you all are familiar 
um, with the guided tissue regeneration, the GTR technique, when you put here a barrier membrane over the defect, and that also can be used in situations like, like here with a bony defect with a vocation involvement degree true. Here you see putting the membrane over the defect. And in some clinical situations you can be successful. Let's see this case here with a deep intrabony defect. You see here with a periodontal probe the situation. You see here the bony defect, the bony wall. The defect has been properly cleaned and then treated by using a bone substance material and a membrane. This is a clinical situation 12 months post-operatively. On the left you see the pocket depths before treatment 10-12 millimeters. After 12 months you see a 4 millimeter remaining pocket and if you if we see the development of the bone here. This is after 12 months what it looked like and this was before treatment. You see the defect going back to the apex and we see that there's a big potential of the body for uh, regeneration of the tissues. However, the membrane technique has a lot of technical problems. If, for instance, you have an exposition of the membrane like here, a membrane that is exposed because the soft tissue is not covering the defect, this is a scheme for the situation, then of course you immediately have um, oral bacteria and oral biofilm on the membrane in the tissue and also under the membrane in the new regenerating tissue. This is a specimen of an old membrane that has been removed from an infected situation and of course this is not what we need for regeneration. The use of bone fillers or, or bone substitutes can be useful. We use the bone fillers like seen here mainly for filling and stabilization of the wound. You, sh you see the scheme here. And we use it very often to support the soft tissue, support over the defect to prevent collapsing of the soft tissue. However, since 1997 we are able to use and we know a lot about it to use enamel matrix proteins that is called the amnogen, Stroman amnogen material for periodontal regeneration using the principle of biomimicry that means we imitate a process that plays a role in the formation in, of, the, of the periodontal apparatus in early childhood and we use the same principle in the adult patient. On the clinical point of view we have a small, narrow but deep vertical defect. You see a preoperative x-ray and after, surge, after using strom and amnogain in the periodontal surgery, surgical session you see after eight months a very nice bone regeneration on this molar. The principle of using this enamel matrix protein, as I told you, was that we imitate the process that plays a role in formation of the wound of, of the root and the cementum in early childhood. So this is the principle formation of cemental and periodontal attachment through imitation of the embryonic development of the root. And these were a lot of, this is a scheme that comes from the team of Martha Sommerman that was published at that time, showing the Hertwig epithelial root sheath, um, promoting the, the formation of, or the, the, the migration of dental follicle cells getting, becoming to um, cementoblasts on the root surface and at this part of the lower part of the root, um, large amounts of enamel, pro enamel matrix proteins are secreted by these cells of the root sheath. That means this is a single molecule 
that makes it possible to build up the cementum and the periodontal ligament on the not yet mineralized root surface. So the principle is the epi epithelial root sheath secretes enamel matrix proteins and this induces the formation of a cellular cementum. This is the key, the key tissue of course, a cellular cementum and the formation of a periodontal ligament. Here again you see an example in the histological slide, new cementum, new ligament, new bone. And we are substituting the naturally occurring enamel matrix proteins by using the commercially available amnogen gel. That was, there was a lot of studies from mainly in the 90s. You see a Lars Hammerstrom's group from Sweden in 97. They did fundamental work on using amnogen. And they were the first that were able to show the formation of cementum bone and a new periodontal ligament on a root surface that has been properly, that has been before exposed. So let's come back to the clinical situation. You see here a, 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 a first and second molar in the lower jaw, infrabony pocket. You see it very clearly distally to this molar. This was a situation after so after scaling and root planning, there is still a pocket of a remaining pocket of around 10 millimeters. This is a 50, 10 millimeter. This is a 50 millimeter probe. So you have a remaining pocket of 10 millimeters. And as you know from all studies, this will not be a stable situation. So we build up the flap. We prepare a flap with a microsurgical approach, try to preserve as much tissue as possible, then we clean up the defect, we remove all granulation tissue. This is the probe, the 10 millimeter probe, and here's 50 millimeter, here's 10 millimeters, and that was the soft tissue pocket, what you saw before, and it's around 7 to 8 millimeters a bone, bony defect. Then the procedure starts by using the PREF gel. This is an EBTA gel, 24% that stays around two minutes here on the root surfaces and in the area. Then it is rinsed away and when it is rinsed away you should end up with a very clean root surface that is free of blood, of course. Then you apply the Strom and Amnogen gel on the proper root surface that has been conditioned by using the PREF gel. This is an example how to apply. Then you close the situation, of course, and again the x-ray that was before the surgery after curettage, and this is two years after surgery. Again, you see a nice new formation in bone and a clinical attachment gain. Let's see for another example. This is a tooth. You see the x-ray, the first molar here in the upper. You see the x-ray. It's a deep bony defect also with focation involvement. You see here the pocket depth. It's 9 millimeter focation de degree 2. So with a, only using scaling and root planning, will certainly not enough for a stable situation. We have started here the surgery. And on the next slide, you will see here the circular incision. Very careful with a microsurgical approach. So you see the situation when the flap was reflected. This is a situation after cleaning the defect and removing all granulation tissue. And of course, here we need a substitution of the missing tissue. So we use the amnogen together with a bone 
substitute material. We used in this case the bone ceramic material. This is first um, this is first put here on the root surfaces a layer of the endogain material. Then we prepare a mixture of the bone substitute material with the rest of the endogain and we put it in the pocket in the fucation defect to support the soft tissue healing and however to promote a biological approach of regeneration. This is the suturing situation from the palatal, the sutures from the buccal side. Seven days after surgery, the buccal side removing the sutures and here is the palatal side um, after removing the sutures. The patients are usually rinsing with chlorhexidine. This is a cause for the discoloration here. But you see a very nice soft tissue healing even in this very, prun um, very pronounced cases. So six, six months later, it looks very nicely. We have a nice reconstitution of the papilla. And we are getting rid of the deep pocket. Let's go back a little bit to the principle of using endogen. What is it we are putting? In fact, the main protein which is in the material is an amelogenin. It's a, it's a main protein in the enamel matrix proteins. It, it is dissolved in the PGA gel. It's a propylene glycol alginate. It's a usual um, gel that is used in many formulations. And it is to say that the origin of the material is, the, is isolated from tooth germ, from porcine, that is done in Sweden. And it contains no other BMPs or no other growth factors. So it's not a pure material, it's a mixture of natural, you see it's a protein mixture. You have a natural material coming from porcine and it's a mixture that um, we apply in the surgical area. The PGA gel is often used in food and pharmaceutical products as a gel solvent. The amelogenin is a, a little bit strange protein. It's hardly soluble at body temperature and has physiologic pH. So the amelogenin is dissolved in, acidic, in the acidic P, PGA gel. It's around pH 3 to 4. Then the, you put it in the, on the root surface and you can also put it on the bone as we know that it promotes, it stimulates the, the migration of all mesenchymal cells. So the amelogenin precip precipitates on the root surface because of the changed pH and the other body temperature. And then we end up, and this is very important, with the absorption of a layer of endogain on the root surface. So it's like a physiological coating of the root surface. This is also the reason why it is so important to have a blood-free, proper, clean root surface. Let's see again a clinical case, a deep localized pocket here. It's kind of a localized aggressive periodontitis on the first molar on the right and the first molar on the left side. So this is the surgical view on the first molar on the right side. You see open up the flap, then we have to remove the granulation tissue. This is then applying after applying the breath gel and applying the endogain. This is then the suturing from lingual and the suturing from the buccal side. And as you see, this is very clearly, very often to be seen, a very nice soft tissue healing. This is only one week after the surgery. On the left side, it was a quite similar situation. This is preoperative. This is the surgical view. And this is after suturing. And what do we end up? This is the situation in 2003. These are the pockets. 
and these are the remaining pockets 2006, three years after using the MNOGAIN material. You see there are no more deep pockets and the prognosis for the molars are much better than before the surgery and we, we see it also on the x-ray. This is a lower on the left and this is the first molar on the right side three years after surgery. So this gives us a certain certainty for a stable situation and um, Coming back to the, to the scientific background of these amelogenins, we saw, we, we said that it's, it's a principle that imitates biological formation of root formation, but we can ask which functions do the amelogenins have in detail? And so many studies have been carried out with human PDL cells that were harvested for instance, in this study as primary cells from the root surface of teeth that were extracted for orthodontic reasons. So this is the principle. We take these cells here, and this is a fibroblastic tissue culture. Then we can put the enamel matrix proteins, and many studies were able to show certain functions of these proteins. The main functions were that enamel matrix proteins increase functions of PDL cells and of osteoblasts also, because these are all mesenchymal cells in vitro. For instance, cell proliferation is increased. The synthesis of collagen 1 is increased. This is very important because the collagen plays an essential role in wound healing. The synthesis of IGF-1, that is indolene-like growth factor 1, um, is um, increased and we find a lot of lot more expression of matrix proteins that are associated with periodontal regeneration that is osteopontin as osteonectin for instance and others and we see also um, more mineralization if we put the enamel matrix proteins in a tissue culture together with an osteoblast like cell line so we have a lot of biological functions that play a role in the healing. And going one step further, we performed an animal study, putting the enamel matrix proteins here in a Caucasian degree 3 situation. And we checked the healing. And what we saw there, what we saw in this specimen um, were that we found a regeneration, as it is written here, that was published then some years later of our group, the regeneration of bone and periodontal ligament induced by recombinant amelogenin after periodontitis. That means that the root surfaces in the animal study that were before infected with oral bacteria. And you see here the histological slide. This is the notch, the basis of the defect. The area one is seen here on the in the middle picture. This is a notch. This is the old cementum. This is a new cementum. This is a new periodontal ligament, and this is a new bone that is built above the apical extension of the defect. And if we see here on the on this area two, this is shown here in a higher magnification. We see here very nicely. This is a dentin here and this is an extracellular matrix forming on the root surface with already inserting fibers prior to the mineralization process that would have occurred, occurred a little bit later. So we see very nicely a clear regeneration in the histological anal analysis. In the clinical use we have experience since maybe 18 years now, but we have not so many long-term study, studies yet. So this was the first long-term study from a Swedish group of Hedane and Wenström and dealing with the long-term stability of endogen gel. These were um, defects with 
pocket probing depths of around 8.5 millimeters, a K-series, and it's the same principle as I outlined before, first using deep scaling and root planing. At baseline before surgery, there should have been more than 6 millimeters of attachment loss, and then a regenerative surgical therapy with amnogain was performed. We see here the clinical attachment level gain after one year, it's 4.3, after five years is 5.3. The pocket depth reduction 4.9 and 5.2 after five years. This, that was not statistically significant different, but you see it's a stable result and a even a little bit more, but we can say that during one and five years, there is a very stable situation. That This means that we can expect if we have gained tissue after one year that it's also stable after five years and depending on the recall and the things of the um, of the um, patient and all of the patient if he is smoker or not and so on. If we see for another in another long-term study from Cortellini and Tonetti they pointed out that around 96% of the GTR treated teeth were still in function after 10 years. This is a very important feature, I think, because we know that if we treat patients with these regenerative methods, that we have that we have a, a very stable situation for a long time. So, in this case, we have a deep pocket after orthodontic therapy distal to this molar. It's not very clear on the x-ray. However, if you see on the clinical and if you do the probing pocket depths, you see there's a deep pocket. So it was, it was um, first scaled and root planed and you see it's around seven, six, eight millimeter pocket depths on the distal aspect of the first molar. Then we opened up the flap in the usual procedure. This on the right is putting the PREF gel and on the lower it's then after rinsing the PREF gel away using the amnogain. How does it look? This is directly post-operative. This is one week later when we remove the sutures. It's again the same picture. The early wound healing is mainly free of complications and significant better to the normal flap surgery. This, this was shown by many studies and this is a very common issue that we see in the clinics. Nine months later you see the first molar again. You see the pocket depth is only three millimeters and here on the x-ray it's nothing to be seen, but as before, it was very difficult on the x-ray. This is important, the situation after 10 years. You see that it's a very stable situation, again on the x-ray, but however, if we probe, we have no po probing pocket depths anymore here on this tooth, and I think we can say this tooth is has a very good long-term stability. So we have a wide range of using amnogain with in the vertical infrabony defects with good success and we have good scientific data to um, use this for the good of the patients. A second big area of using enamel matrix proteins, of course, is the treatment of gingival recession using regenerative surgery. And you see already here a first picture of a long-term result. This was a recession on the lower canine before surgery and you see nine years after treatment it was one coronally flap procedure using amnogain also. You see a very stable situation. You see a good keratinized thick tissue and this seems to be a stable, long-term stable situation. So when do we use 
mucogingival surgery. It's mainly when we have thin or missing keratinized gingiva in the buccal area. Often it's associated with bone dehiscences, often with inflammations, and sometimes orthodontic therapies may even enhance the mucogingival problems. However, if I see a situation like here, then we can offer the patient a good method to treat. We do a coronally advanced flap procedure using amnogain, and this was around four weeks after surgery, the second picture, and the second picture, and the third picture is the same tooth after one year. There's a wide range for periodontal plastic surgery, as here you see this, saw this case, or you see this case, and you can also deal with situations with fracture, deep fracture teeth, and um, so we we have we can deal with a lot of complicated situations. So the a very good technique and a, a technique that has been described and where we have good long-term results for is a coronally advanced flap technique for recession coverage. It's again the same question. How can we improve the success rates in a reproducible way and also the long-term stability? For instance, let's see this patient here that had been treated with periodontal surgery missing one slide because this is the end result but I will show you in another um, examples like here the recession coverage with the addition of amnogain this is the baseline this is the result after 12 months again here on this lower left slide it's the beginning the starting point and this is after 12 years so we have a very good procedure and I want to go with you in the details to show you how the technique is performed. The coronally advanced flap in the original technique is used with two, two vertical incisions outlining over the mucogingival line. You start usually by measuring the recession depths on the tooth, on the tooth surface, and then you measure the same distance from the tip of the old papilla to the tip of your new created, of your papilla that is new created by your surgery. So for instance, if this red arrow is around four millimeters, this should also be four millimeters. Then you, from this point, you do the vertical incision and the same on the other side of the tooth and you connect both incisions by a circular incision and here it's very important to preserve the tissue as much as possible on the buccal side because this tissue is then replaced on the root surface that has no vascularization. Of course we have here a Miller class 1 that means the interdental bone is not infected and is still present. So the procedure continues. It's a vertical incision. You see the flap is reflected. Then you have to de the papilla regions, which is indicated by the black triangles here. This is done by scissors or a little scalpel. Then everything is prepared and you have to perform a periosteum, you have to, to, to cut the periosteum at the basis of the flap that the flap can be reflected without tension in the coronal position. So I continue. This is then after reposition of the flap, the fixation of the flap with sutures, you can use single sutures or sling sutures here just to secure the soft tissue flap over the defects. And of course you have to secure the vertical incisions to have a good adaptation of the flap.
then let's see for the healing this is after one week two weeks and this is six months and on the left you see how we started how we came from this was the baseline and this is the result after six months so you see a good keratinized tissue over these two incisors and a situation that is very satisfying for the patient another case showing an issue that is very important that is here when you have like in this example when you have a composite filling on the root surface of course this has to be removed before using this technique you have to remove and to prepare a proper dentine surface that was done here you see here reduction of the filling and preparing of a proper dentine surface circular incisions with prepa preparation of the new papilla left and right from the tooth the same technique again vertical incisions here over the mucogingival line left and right then we mo mobilize the periosteum as i said by cutting the periosteum here at the base of the flap then we do the root conditioning with a pref gel and apply the amnogain on the root surface as shown here suturing on the upper left suture removal around one week later and this is four weeks after the surgery you see a nice coverage of the recession defects and the good healing quite after quite a short time the interesting thing of course is again the long-term result this is the same tools this was a baseline left upper and the right lower is the same tooth after four years it's you see it's a stable situation however not to confuse you we later took also the crowns from the premolars away put a similar procedure coronally flap procedure here and put new crowns here so this is not the original situation compared to the premolar and the upper but the long-term result however which i want to show you is on the canine here then we saw it's a very good result also in long-term um, observation so we have of course some scientific data for this procedure and in 2008 in the um, european federation of periodontology in the consensus report there was a systematic review of coronary F advanced flap procedures with different combinations with connective tissue graft amnogain other membranes and so on i don't want to get so much into detail but you see the outcome the the um, most important outcome was that the significant better results if you use a connective tissue graft or the amnogain together with a connective um, with the connective uh, the coronally advanced flap procedure so um, i would like to show you a little film that we performed in a in a situation on a upper in the upper jaw a multiple recession procedure that we performed by using endogain it's a short film showing the essential technique it's as i lined out and you see here there is some yeah there is the there's the incision here it's distally to the the canine on the left upper uh, jaw then it's the incision here we cut the new papilla we cut the new papilla here we create here the new papilla try to preserve the tissue on the buccal side as much as possible because we need a 
a full flap here for a coverage of the recession defects. This is then again, of course, a short version of the procedure, the preparation of the flap on the right side. The flap on the left has already been reflected. The reflection of the flap again, the cane up to the canine on the right side. And then we do the, which is very important, to cut the periosteum to mobilize, to be able to mobilize the flap in a coronal situation, in the coronal position. There's still some missing, so we need to cut a little bit more, which is shown here. This is the crucial thing when you, when you apply this technique. So and if it's not enough, you have to cut in a second dimension that the flap can be reflected without too much tension or without any tension at its best on the coronal position. This has to be done, of course, very careful. So you see it here. So the flap stays in the desired position. Then we have to de-epitalize the old papilla, the old interdental tissue. I do it here with the scissors, micro scissors. This also has to be done very careful because you need a connective tissue bed and you should remove um, all epithelium on the surface. We do this with magnifying glasses, of course, in a microsurgical approach. We clean the root surfaces. That means these parts that had been that had been exposed before to the oral cavity. Then we rinse. Uh, we have a clean surface on all six teeth. Then we apply here, as you see, the PREF gel to condition the root surface. It demineralizes the root surface and removes the last smear layer that may be present on the root surface. We leave it two minutes in place. We rinse it away, and then we have a proper clean root surface that is prepared for putting the endogame. Then we put the endogame material on the root surfaces and also in excess on the bone. We leave, we leave it for maybe half a minute or a minute on the root surface that the protein film um, has enough time to absorb on the root surfaces. And then we suture. Suturing, again, usually is not that difficult. You usually use normal single sutures or sling sutures if the interdental papilla is not strong enough or not thick enough to secure the position of the flap. So this is putting the first suture here. This is a single suture. Then you see how nicely the flap will be posed on the root surface. The flap should be secured, should not be put too much pressure. As I told you, the main thing is to be free of tension by doing a proper mobilization of the periosteum at the basis of the flap. So this is a First suture here, and of course, of time reasons, we skip a lot of suturing procedure. This is a, then the last suture that we applied here, showing that a sling suture sometimes may help you to secure the, the soft tissue in the proper position. So we start here suturing 
between the the lateral incisor and the canine going through this canine taking the papilla between the canine and the first premolar then bringing the sutra around back to the point where we started at the nasal papilla and then you see a very nice positioning of the flap. So we can use this material of course for single recession defects but we can very nicely also do multiple recessions. As you see here these are six teeth that have been treated. This is the end result. If you have some endogain left you may put some on the sutures because it helps a little bit the healing but of course the most important thing is the proper closure of the of the defect. So how does it look then after six months? You will see the next slide in a in a second. This is then the that this will be the six months result. Okay, thank you for showing the film. And this is the same patient six months post operatively. You see here a very nice keratinized tissue in the whole upper front. So what we did, and this is the last important um, issue of my presentation, is the long-term result. We had done a study here in two centers in Germany, a, a study on a coronally advanced flap procedure with endogain a randomized study with a blinded examiner, a placebo controlled situation in a split mouse design. And I will show you some details of the study. The inclusion criteria was that we had to deal with buccal recessions of at least three millimeters that had to be contralateral in the same jaw. As you see here, two examples, and this were only splints for measuring the situation. Then we always started by doing the surgery on the left side and prior to suturing on the left patient side a randomization code was revealed by a third person that came into the surgical room and either it was the test substance that was the Stroman endogain material that was applied as you see here on the root surface or it was a control that was a PGA gel without any active proteins. And this is part of the study. You see a typical example, baseline 10 days post-op, three weeks post-op, three months post-op, 12 months post-op. However, after 12 months, this is only short term. And what we need, of course, is long term. After 12 months, if you see on the literature, there's one a review of work by Cheng and co-workers showing that after 12 months, the situation by using a coronary advanced flap plus amnogain with 84% is much more stable than a coronary flap alone with only 54% root coverage if they control for every for each study that has been published at that time dealing with that topic. However, our long-term results are very interesting. So you see the same patient. This is the same patient after nine years. So after nine years, it's a very, very nice thick tissue and it shows you a stable situation without any re recession again. These are some examples from the study. This is always baseline, baseline. So this was the first, the, the canine on the right and the canine on the left. After nine years on the right side, this was the endogain treated side. This was a control side showing much more recession. Then another example, this was baseline, baseline. This was the control. This time the control was a right side and this time the endogain side was a, 
on the left and here you see a very nice tissue here. This was the most difficult patient in the study that was more than 8 millimeters measured here from the um, cemento enamel junction up to the apex on both sides. So you see this is the result, sorry there's some problem here with the slide, but this is the result after nine years already. You see this is the same patient undergoing only one surgery, left was a control and right was the endocane. However, you see how nicely the tissue is developing. However, here you can say both sides have reacted very nicely and we have very stable results even in a difficult case like here. And we can create a lot of keratinized thick tissue without using any connective tissue graft. This patient here, this is the last patient from this series showing the baseline on the right side that was a control. This is after nine years. On the left side, baseline on the left side after nine years. And you see here a very nice tissue, some relapse in the control. It's much better than in the beginning, of course, but on the endogen side, it's much more stable. And this is what we think after having measured a lot of patients from this study. We think in the long-term maintenance, if you see the results, that you can say, however, both methods resulted in significant root coverage compared to baseline. However, most sites treated <coughs> with coronal leaf flap alone showed tissue loss between 12 months and 9 years. And the sites treated with coronal advanced flap plus amnogain resulted in significant higher recession coverage and showed more long-term stability, especially in cases of deeper recessions of more than 4 millimeters. So I thank you very much for your attention and thank you for staying with me in the webinar room. And of course, I'm glad if there are any questions that can be answered. Thank you very much. So I see here, so um, I, try to answer the questions that came in in the meantime. So the first question was by Dr. Bandali, and thank you for this question, that the tooth gets ankylosis. And I think this is a question not dealing with the recession defects, but more with the with a infrabony defects. But I can answer you we won't, we haven't seen any ankylosis in any of the specimen. And we think that there is not the problem of ankylosis. However, what we see is a, a connective tissue ligament. So don't be afraid of getting too much uh, ankylosis. So the next question here, I can answer, I hope. And the question is, does it always have to be a wall for the procedure to work? Can it be done on horizontal bone loss? That is from Dr. Monica De Leon. Thank you very much also. And um, this is to state that you need a bone wall for a regenerative procedure. If you have a pure horizontal defect, of course you can use the endogain because it helps you for the soft tissue, maybe a little bit for the hard tissue healing. But it will not end up in significant amount of regeneration. That has been shown and so in the horizontal defects it's not a situation that is really a very good um, regenerative possibility. With neither, there's no material, by the way. It's, it's really a problem of the bone wall. It's not depending on the material. And 
the next question is from Dr. Van der Felde. Do you advise the use of antibiotics to improve the healing? For instance, doxycycline, um, like Cortellini sometimes does. I have to tell you that we don't give any antibiotics. And there was a, a remark by Dr. Alexander, no antibiotics usually also. And I, I'm um, convinced that we don't use any antibiotics because we are not dealing with a with a um, in with an inflammation, at least in the recession type defects, in the infra bony defects. We also use very seldom, very rarely antibiotics. So you should um, get rid of the of a acute inflammation before you start the surgery. So maybe if you have a, a case with an aggressive periodontitis, you can of course sometimes use antibiotics. But this should then be done. This should then be done with. Um, in the first phase, when you do the curettage and when you open up the flap, there should be not a very acute inflammation situation. So, of course, some people um, prefer to give antibiotics um, just to be on the safe side. But usually, we don't get it only in cases of complications. So the next question from Dr. Rami Daniel was, sometimes there's no enough gingiva to be sutured over the amnogain. What is the solution for just a case? This is a very clinical, very important issue. And of course, we try to, to cover the defect totally with a Amdogain, uh, totally with the soft tissue, even when we use amdogain by splitting the periosteum, for instance. However, um, it's not always possible. If it's not possible, of course, using the amdogain is not such a big problem when you compare it to having a membrane exposed. If you have a, a membrane, a barrier membrane exposed, you immediately have the or a biofilm on the membrane. With the endogain, it's much more easier because even when we don't get it completely by splitting the periosteum, then usually the healing is very nicely, even if it's a little bit exposed. But so I want, I would like to say that this would not prevent me from using the endogain material if we don't have enough soft tissue. And I think it's even the best way because it helps the mesenchymal cells, the fibroblasts, healing. That means you saw the co collagen formation, the cell prolifer pro proliferation is much better when we put the enamel matrix proteins. So we have a positive effect, and I think this is a very important and very um, clinical useful issue. So the next question from Dr. Quirk, thank you. What do you do about the original papilla in the coronary advanced flap you recommend? So usually I, I only de -epitalize. Maybe it's 0 0.5, 0 0.5 millimeters. That's all. And I clean up, of course, all exposed areas of the root surface to get rid of the local biofilm, of course. Good. The next question, I think we still have some minutes. I try to get through it. And if if a question is not be answered in the proper time, of course, I invite you to write an email to my email address that was shown at the end of the presentation. And um, I would then like to answer it a little bit later, but I try to get as much questions as possible. There's another question from Dr. Panagiotis Karamitsa. Thank you. Do you recommend any antiseptic solution after the surgery? Yes, of course. I 
I um, recommend usually a chlorhexidine rinsing after the surgery. This, that is true for the recession defects as well as for the intraboni defects because import, it's important to prevent bacteria to invade in the um, defects and usually chlorhexidine or maybe other antiseptics like uh, Listerine or others but usually I prefer chlorhexidine for at least until suture remo removal. I usually um, recommend it a little bit longer even after suture removal maybe for two weeks or three weeks just to be sure that there are no bacteria in the in the area. There is another <coughs> question from Dr. Yusuf Alzayani and the question is in case of deep pockets of rotation involvement grade 3 is it better to use amnogain along with bone substitute and was it, what is the cost effectiveness compared to GTR alone? Uh, that is a clinic a very important issue of course. Usually if I have a vocation degree 3. It's not the typical situation for regeneration. However, sometimes of course you need to deal with degree 3 and so if in a difficult situation, let's say degree 3 or maybe a difficult deep pocket or vocation involvement degree 2, then I often combine amnogain with a bone substitute. I think it's a very clinical, very useful combination because it helps you to support the soft tissue and helps you in the healing process, although you know that most of the bone substitutes are not biologically active. However, we have the biologic active agent by the endogen and then we have a more or less passive filler to improve the clinical situation, the, the healing situation and to stabilize the blood clot. So I use it quite often and of course it's more, there are more costs for the patient. However, I think compared to other therapies, it's a good alternative and um, I won't I would like to recommend to use it even if it's a little bit more in cost than the GTR alone. But the results are much better and this is what what is important for the patient. So the next question by Dr. Konstantin uh, Kobetz is in film you didn't cut lip frenulum. What is the reason? This is <laughs> a point I you are right, absolutely right. Um, I even left the frenulum in place because I want, wanted to secure the flap on the frenulum. And the frenulum, there was no recession in the interdental area when, where the frenulum was inserting. So this is not, I think it's not the reason why the patient has any recession. So I think we can leave it. The patient has no problem with it doesn't disturb my healing so I left it. However, I have to admit that in many cases it's necessary to cut a frenulum before you do the procedure. For instance, very often in the lower lower front you have a frenula that has to be cut before doing the coronary flap procedure. It's a, it's a good advice and sorry I didn't mention it when showing the film. The next, I think, maybe the last question would be that from Dr. Diego Navas. Do you use membranes in all of the cases when you do surgeries of resection with endogain? And so I have to say I don't use these membranes. I just put the endogain as I showed you and in especially for this recession um, defects, I won't um, recommend a normal barrier membrane. However, we have now um, 
these collagen matrices that may help us in situations with thin tissue. That's right. There we are a little bit in the beginning to learn, but in the cases you, sh you, you saw, these were all done just putting Embrogain. And I think the big advantage is the early and very good healing, and that is, um, this was counts for me for the patient. The next question is GDW, GDW, sorry. How predictable is a regeneration technique using amlogain in class 2 forcation defects in maxillary, maxillary molars? So it's, I think it's forever the best technique we can apply today. The predictable, predictability um, is not that high, however. So it depends. I apply it if I have a good situation. That means if I have a thick, con if I have a thick um, keratinized tissue, a thick gingiva in a patient with a good oral hygiene and that has a good reaction on the first of my periodontal treatment. So I already see the reaction of the tissues when I do the scaling and root planning. And if I see a good tissue reaction, then I think we go for indications that are not really um, evidence-based by scientific studies. So in vocation defect two in maxillary molars, especially in the meso and distal vocation involvement defects, of course there are not so many data. So you are you are not in the typical indication for a regeneration. However, as I told you, if the patient is a patient, the defect and the whole patient situation seems to be good for a for a regenerative procedure, I would however recommend to use this as we know that it's certainly better than the normal membrane technique, certainly better than a normal flap procedure without doing anything or certainly also better than to extract the tooth. So this is a recommendation I think that it's not really evidence-based however and there's not much predictability available but I think it's a, a clinical experience that I would however recommend to do it in the proper situation. So I think the last question, I don't know if we still have some time. I think we have some out of time and um, was from Dr. Nayatal. Thank you for the question. How long do we wait after initial preparation of the defect before operation? So I wait around two to three months. After search, after scaling and root planning, and then I do the remeasurements around two to three months after the first phase, and then I start the surgical sessions. This is not different from when I use a normal flap procedure without regenerative approach. Yeah, the last, I think we still have some time, yes. Okay, so I can continue to answer the questions from Dr. Lugan. In cases where there's no attached gingiva left, do we use free gingiva graft or endogain technique? So um, it depends, I, I like to say. We have cases, we have many cases done without any attached gingiva left. That means Miller class two cases only by the endogain technique and that is that has been very successful also. If I have very thin tissue, however, and the all surrounding tissues are very thin, maybe then you first use a free gingiva graft to have a better better 
responsibility to handle the flap. But it's not a standard procedure. So usually if, if it's a millet class 2 without any attached gingiva left, then I go also for the endogame technique. And interestingly, in our long-term study, there were also case 1 and case 2 cl um, cl uh, class 2 cases. Um, we saw also a very nice soft tissue healing and formation of keratinized tissue in the cases um, of class, Miller class 2. So I think it's possible to do without free general graph because the aesthetics to go directly in the endogain procedure, it's much better in the end. So I think maybe there's one last question. So I think everything is okay. And I thank you for the staying with me in the webinar room and thank you for the questions and if anything remains open please then send me an email and I'll be glad to answer you. Thank you very much.